right, let's talk about the pectoralis major. We have one on the left side, one on the right side, and the origin is actually going to be a couple different spots. We're gonna have the medial portion of the clavicle, we'll have uh, the sternum, and then we're also gonna have the car uh, costal cartilages of the true ribs, which is also known as ribs one through seven. And so here, um, it'll be right here. I don't have the clavicle, but it'll be right here, here, and then the this portion right here. Now, notice that these fibers are going to converge, right? Remember, the pectoralis major is an excellent example of a convergent muscle, and they will insert onto the humerus. And specifically, this portion right here, this is the lateral crest of the intertubercular groove, or real close right here to the greater tubercle. The action of the pectoralis major is to cause flexion at the shoulder joint. And that makes sense, right? If you imagine this muscle kind of going across like that and connecting. Okay, now other things it can do is it can actually adduct the arm, right? Remember the arm is the anatomical arm is this portion right here. So it will also adduct. And then it can also medially rotate. So that means we're gonna take this bone and we will turn it inwards or medially. But the main one, the agonist, that's what that word agonist means, is the primary action of this muscle is uh, to flex the arm. Now let's look at a really interesting one. This is called the serratus anterior you may also see the term serratus ventralis. So remember ventral or ventralis just refers to the front side, which is the same as saying anterior uh, on a biped. So the serratus ventralis or serratus anterior kind of looks like a serrated blade. Now don't confuse this with the external oblique, which is this portion right here. I'll kind of uh, show you for context. A lot of students will mix up the external oblique for the serratus anterior. Let me show you on this side as well. That's the serratus anterior. This is the external oblique. Okay, so I guess what is that? On this model, it's number 19. Okay, now the um, origin of the serratus anterior is going to be the ribs. Okay, so it'll be in this area right here. And the insertion is actually going to be the anterior portion of the scapula. So if you imagine these kind of going here, let me show you on my little skeleton here that is um, it's falling apart, but I've had this since undergrad, so very special to me. So origin right here, insertion is actually going to be on the inside or the anterior portion of the scapula pretty close to the vertebral column. Okay, so the action is going to be the agonist of scapula protraction. So remember when we protract, we are moving anteriorly. Okay, so the scapula, and that makes sense, right? If the muscle is basically going like this and it's pulling or contracting, it's gonna pull that scapula just like that. Um, the other thing it does is it superiorly rotates the scapula, which is kind of the same thing. And then it's going to stabilize the scapula as well. So that is the serratus anterior. And again, pay attention to what my students commonly mix up as the external oblique. Don't make that mistake. Let's move on to the external oblique. Okay, so this is going to be the right side. This is going to be the left. Remember, do not confuse this with the serratus anterior, okay? So this is the external oblique. If you're looking at the numbers, that would be 21 on this model. And then right here. The origin of the external oblique is going to be the lower eight ribs. So if you imagine the rib cage here, these lower eight ribs will be the origin and the insertion will be a few points. Number one, it will be the pelvis, and specifically the iliac crest and the pubis, as well as this white line right here called the linea alba, which literally means white line. 
Quick fun fact, if you have ever seen or had a dark line that runs down the center of your belly during pregnancy, that's actually the darkening of this linea alba, which is a connective tissue. So that's kind of cool. The external obliques have a couple of different functions. One of them is that it, they will uh, compress the abdomen. And the other one is that each side can rotate the trunk laterally. Now let's talk about some really important muscles of respiration. Now these are not shown on the muscle model I have because they are deeper. So all I've done is I've just taken some different colored string I have and I've tied them to the different ribs. Now you notice I have two colors, green and yellow. I'll tell you right off the bat that the green is going to represent the external intercostal muscles and the yellow will represent the internal intercostal muscles. Let's start with the external intercostal muscles. Now these are more external and the origin is going to be the rib above. The insertion is the rib below. Now I've only done one little example here, but remember this is going to be all down the rib cage on both sides. So if the insertion moves toward the origin and all of them are doing that, what that's going to do is that will elevate the ribs and cause our rib cage or thoracic cage to open up or expand. So when we are in quiet and forced inspiration, meaning we are inhaling, so go ahead and do that right now. Maybe you felt your chest kind of rise what you felt was, well, one of the things were these external intercostal muscles pulling your rib cage up. Now let's look at the internal intercostals. So the internal intercostals are, are more internal or they are deeper. The origin is going to be the rib below and the insertion will be the rib above. So again, imagine this all the way down on both sides. If the insertion is moving toward the origin, what is that going to do when these little muscles contract? Yes, they are going to depress the ribs, and this happens during forced expiration or when we exhale. So go ahead and do that real fast. Maybe you feel your rib cage kind of coming downwards. That is uh, because your internal intercostal muscles are contracting, causing everything to kind of move in this inferior direction. If you're struggling to remember these things, my little trick is just to memorize one of them and then the paired term is just the opposite. Now, I know that is not super fancy or anything like that, but sometimes that's just how it is, right? Um, for me personally, it's easier to memorize the external intercostals. And, you know, when I take an inhale and I think about how that makes my body feel, um, it just makes more sense to me. And then when I think about the internal intercostals, everything is just the opposite. The origin, the insertion, the action, action um, is pretty much just the opposite. So, if you have a better way to memorize this, please let me know in the comments, um, especially if you're a student. I'd, I'd love getting the student input and hearing how y'all think about this stuff. Um, but other times, it's just a matter of choosing whichever one is easier and knowing that the pair is the exact opposite. Now let's talk about the rectus abdominis, which are these muscles right here. The origin is going to be the pubis, and I'll show you on my little skeleton right here. Remember, the pubis is this part of the pelvic girdle right here, and also that pubic symphysis. So that is the origin, and the insertion is going to be the sternum and the lower ribs. So let me pull this down. The insertion, sternum, and lower ribs. Let's talk about some actions of the rectus abdominis. So the main one is that um, if we're facing like so, uh, the rectus abdominis will cause flexion of the vertebral column or flexion of the trunk is another way to think about that. But there are some other really important functions that involve compressing the abdominal cavity. So things like 
um, forced expiration, um, childbirth, ouch, ouch, um, and even things like weightlifting and, yes, pooping. You use your abs when you poop. Ew, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but maybe you won't forget that now. So flexion of the trunk and then also compressing the abdominal wall. Now let's look at the dorsal or posterior sign. And I'd like to start with the large, single, kite-shaped muscle called the trapezius. Now there are two origins for this muscle. One is going to be the occipital bone, and the other origin will actually be C7 through T12. So all of these vertebrae right here. The insertion for this muscle is actually going to be the clavicle as well as the spine of the scapula and the acromion on both sides. Now, as you can see, this is a very large muscle and there are three different sets of fibers. We have a superior set, a middle set, and an inferior set, and they all three do something different, which again, when you have larger muscles like this, you may see multiple actions listed for them, and that's why. So the main action of the trapezius is that they are going to elevate the scapula or cause you to shrug. And um, if, if you like to work out or you see people who do a lot of CrossFit, they're doing a lot of cleans or shrugs or things like that, they may have well-developed traps. And it's because they are literally performing that action over and over again. A couple other actions of the trapezius is to retract and depress the scapula as well. Next, we have the very large, broad, triangular-shaped latissimus dorsi. The origin of this muscle will be the thoracic, lumbar, and sacral vertebra, as well as the iliac crests. And then the insertion is going to be all the way up here within the intertubercular groove of the humerus. So let me show that on this skeletal model right here. So we have the origin that goes this entire area here, and it's gonna go all the way up like this to that intertubercular groove, which, let me turn this around, is going to be the groove in between the two tubercles of the humerus. So this is one of those muscles that surprised me when I was learning about it in school because you don't really think about really your, your backside and your bottom side being attached to your arm, but that's just the amazing thing about these muscles. So let's go ahead and talk about the action uh, of this muscle to see if we can make sense of its locations. Of the latissimus dorsi are to extend at the shoulder Okay, or bring the arm backwards like so. It will also cause medial rotation. Okay, so since we're looking at the backside, remember that just means it goes inwards. And then it will also cause adduction, adduction. Remember, all of this makes sense because in all of these movements, we're going from the insertion to the origin, the more movable part to the less movable part. Thanks for watching this video. I really hope this helped you visualize all the muscles and origins and insertions a little bit easier. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and I'll see you next time.